I've been in ministry since 1989, and over the years, I just have to let you know that the thing that has encouraged me the most as a part of being a pastor in a ministry is the extraordinary life change I've had the front row of seeing. I've just seen it front row and center, and many of you in this church and uh, others in, I've seen over the years in ministries, their, their lives have just been radically transformed by a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, sometimes the transformation is so um, palpable that I can actually physically see a difference on people, that the, the joy has come into their life. Uh, it's not like they have a new personality. It's just that there is something that's totally radically different. Some of you have experienced that kind of life transformation. And I tell you what, it never, ever gets old for me to see what God is doing in people's lives. And that is something that just, it, it's an amazing thing to see. And the thing over the years that has been the most uh, challenging for me is to see how little some people change. That you see them come and they're, you know, they come week after week or month after month. They may even get involved in some way. And yet, over time, there's really very little change. They feel like or they seem like they're stuck in some rut and, and there's no transformation. There's no discernible change in their life over a period of time. And generally, when you have conversations with people, and I've had conversations with people like that, they'll say, you know what, the reality is I've, I've gotten involved, I'm kind of around the edges, but I've, I've just, I've just kind of kept God out on, on the periphery. I've not really opened my life and opened my heart and allowed him to change. I've actually resisted, though I've been close. And a lot of people say, you know what, it's just not my time right now. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of living the right life. And, you know, I'm, I'm not you know, cheating and stealing and doing all those kinds of things. But really letting God on the inside, it's just not now. Someday I'll open my heart really seriously to God, but not now. Someday I'll get there. And the reality is this. I've been praying that today is that someday for every single one of you. That wherever you are on your journey, no matter how stuck you may feel or no matter how distant you may feel to God, that today is the day that that all changes. We've been in a series uh, based on the parable that Jesus told of the prodigal son. It's called Finding Your Way Back to God. And we're looking, we're going into a deep dive on this story that Jesus told, the most powerful, profound story that's ever been told in my opinion. And we're looking at some of the awakenings that have to happen in a person's heart and life for them to find their way back to God. And in the first week, we just identified the first awakening, and it's simply this. It's the awakening to longing. If there's this question that goes off inside of us, there has to be something more. And we talked about the universal longings that all of us have, the longing for meaning, the longing for purpose, the longing for love, to give love and to receive love. And what happens is, because those longings are inside of us, we search for them all our lives long. And the bottom line that we found on week one was simply this, life's deepest longings are given to us by God. That's a good thing. And they are intended to lead us to him. But so oftentimes, what our problem is, what the challenge is, these longings, we start to search for them outside of a relationship with God. We don't look to God to help fulfill those longings, we look outside. And when we do that, ultimately, it leads us to the second awakening, and that is the awakening to regret. The awakening to regret. Because ultimately, our longings can't be satisfied outside of a relationship with God. And when we run into that brick wall, when we run into that dead end, we have regrets. And we say things like this, I wish I could start over. I wish I could have a redo. I wish I could go back five years and undo some of those decisions. And the bottom line that we had from last week was simply this. Your regrets are a wake-up call from God to get you moving in a new direction, in his direction. That when you start to sense the regrets from your decisions, your regrets from the things that you're pursuing in life, when you feel those regrets on the inside, that ought to be a bell that goes off and says, you know what, God's trying to get your attention. He's trying to get your attention so that you will move in his direction. And that's what we've been talking about. And today, really, we're coming to the third awakening, and this one is a game changer for us, and this one is probably among the hardest, and that is simply this, the awakening to help. The awakening to help. It's where we say, I can't do this on my own. 
A number of years ago, uh, when our kids were littler, my wife and I were in a store and we saw a, a bunk bed that had been reduced, like 60% off. They were, it was a floor model. They were trying to get rid of it. And our kids were in bunk beds that wouldn't bunk anymore. They were so old. You know those kind of beds? You know, it's like they've been patched up and they just didn't work. So we thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to get a really nice bed, a really nice bunk bed at a really cheap price. And so we bought it and then said, hey, we'll be back because we couldn't fit it in our car, obviously. We needed a truck, but I had a, I had a friend that had a truck. And so I said, hey, can I borrow your truck? And he said, yeah, I got this bunk bed. I'm going to put in the bed of your truck. He's like, oh, you'll, you'll need those ratchet straps. You know what those are, right? They look like a seat belt with a, with a, you know, with a little you know, ratchet on it, like a little you know, winch. You've seen those, right? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll put a bunch of them in there. This is a big bed, you know. So I, I go to the store, I pick it up. The employees put it in the back of the bed of the truck, you know. And so I drive away from the, you know, from the front of the building there to go strap this thing in. And so these straps are, they're tangled. They're in a big knot. It's like a, just a big knot. And so I start pulling them out and start untangling them. You know, I've 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and they're still, the, the, the winches are coming off, the little, you know, the, the things are coming off, and they're dropping all over the place. I'm like, that's all right, I got to get this thing untangled, because it was like a big ball of yarn. And so, an hour later, I finally got them all untangled. And so now I start to put those, those, those winches back on there, and I put them in, you know, started to attach them to the different beds of the truck, and I started to move those things, and they wouldn't take, they wouldn't, they wouldn't work on the straps, and I thought, uh-oh, when they dropped, they must have broken or something. And so I kept on doing it, and, then, and I couldn't get them to work. No matter what I did, I couldn't get them to do it. And I thought, I got it. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to get my phone out, and I'm going to Google it. And somebody on YouTube is going to show me how to do this. So I watched YouTube, and I was looking at them. You know, I'm like, I'm doing all the right things. And so, you know, this is, this, I have been in the parking lot People are coming and going. It's almost close to closing time, and I still have not, it's two hours later, I still have not been able to get any of these ratchet straps to work. And so I pulled out my phone again, and I called my friend whose truck, you know, belonged to him, it's his ratchet straps, those god-awful things. And, um, and I called him, and I said, I think the straps are broken. I can't get them to work. I need you to come help me. He said, I'll be right there. And about 30 minutes later, he came over there. He looked at all the things. And in about 43 seconds, he had all the straps working and the whole thing tied in. <laughs> and then it happened. I reached into my back pocket, pulled out my wallet, opened my wallet up, took out my man card, and turned it in. <laughs> I needed help. I, I could not figure this out. Have you ever been in a situation where you just like, no matter what you did, no matter how long you tried, it's like, it was not happening. Now, here's the question. Why is it so hard to say, I can't do this on my own? It's, it's hard, isn't it? How many of you, you, you love to help people. You, you have no problem helping people. But on the other hand, it's like, I cannot ask for help. I just can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't do this on my own. I need help. So because it is so hard for all of us, because it's so hard for all of us, I thought it would be good just to practice saying this out loud. Okay? So let's, let's read it together. All right, here we go. One, two, three. I can't do this on my own. I need help. Let's try it one more time. Now look at somebody next to you and tell them this. I can't do this on my own. I need help. So isn't that freeing, liberating? It's hard. Richard Rohr says this. This is why we can't ask. He says this. We would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the present and let our illusions die. It's so hard. You're probably familiar with the 12-step programs, AA, and some other organizations like that. The very first step in the whole deal you know what it is? The very first step is, is simply this, where we admit we are powerless over our addictions. I, I can't do this. We can't do this. This is not something that we can do on our own. We are powerless. We have no power over this. We need help. And so in this series, we've been, I, at the very beginning, we gave you this challenge. We said, let's make a wager on God. And I hope that you've been praying this prayer. And if you've been praying this prayer every day, you've probably started to see 
God's activity in your life. And the prayer simply goes like this. There are two parts of it. God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. And the part that we're going to add for this week is simply this. Awaken in me the willingness to turn towards you for help. We've been seeing all of these awakenings in the story of Jesus. And if you have your Bible, you want to turn to Luke chapter 15. That's where we are again today. We'll be there for the next couple of weeks. But each week we're picking out more nuggets of truth out of Jesus' story, this powerful power story. It's packed with so much. In verse 11 it says this, Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. This was a wealthy man, large estate. Okay, So he divided his property. This took a while. This wasn't something he just went out and wrote a check out. This is something that he had to measure his property. He had to count his herds. He had to count all of these things and divide them up and make sure that this son, if he was going to give it to him, got the proper share. So he divided his property between them. That took a while. We don't know how long. Maybe a week, two weeks, a month, something. And then it says in the next verse, not long after that, so it took some time, the young son got together all that he had and he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered, say squander. Squander. We're going to come back to that. There he squandered his wealth in wild living. He thought, oh, finally, I'm out. I can do whatever I want. There's no one around me to say, you know what? You probably shouldn't do that. That's probably not a wise decision. You probably ought to not go in that direction. He just wanted to be out on his own because he thought there was something out in the distant country that would fill his heart, that would fill his soul. And it says in the next verse, After he had spent everything, after he'd squandered it all, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Now, when we read this about the famine, we don't think really much about the famine. A famine in modern times is much, much different than a famine would be in ancient times. Because if there's a famine in some part of the world today, people know about it pretty quickly. We have a lot of communication. There's internet and, you know, all kinds of stuff. We can pick up the phone, we see it on TV. And as soon as we find out there's a famine, guess what happens? World Vision shows up. The Red Cross shows up. All kinds of organizations, countries, you know, ship in food and they help people. Not in the ancient days. If there was a famine in a part of the, uh, you know, the world, the news didn't get out about that famine. Other people in other parts of the world had no idea. Even if they were able to help or willing to help, they wouldn't have even known. And what happened, this is, Jesus says, this is not just any famine. This was a severe famine. And when a famine struck the ancient world, crime went way up. Robbery went way up. Children were sold into slavery. People were left to die on the side of the road. Cannibalism went way up. This is what was happening in Jesus' story. They understood. When Jesus said this, they understood, oh, that kind of situation. Now, if you were in that kind of situation, you'd say, you know what? I need, to, I need to get out of Dodge. I need to go back to my dad's house. But the son doesn't do that. He stays. Now, why in the world would he stay? Why didn't he go back? Because he went out, farmed himself out to somebody, you know, who had a, a pig farm, which is something that the Jewish boys would never have done. They would never have been around pigs. But he's out there, and he's starving to death. And it finally says in The next passage, it says, when he came to a census, he said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and I have sinned against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. There's shame all over him. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. Again, Why in the world did he wait so long at the first sign of the famine? Why didn't he get out of there? Why didn't he run for cover? Why didn't he run for help? And what's happening is he is at the end of his rope. There's this need that he's experiencing for help. I can't do this on my own. I think there's something that's happening here in the story that you and I don't know because we're in modern culture, but in Jesus' day, it was very common that if a young Jewish man or, or, or any kind of a Jewish man took his wealth and went into a distant country, into a, an enemy territory, into a Gentile world, and he squandered, that was the word that Jesus used, he squandered his wealth, he lost it all to the Gentiles. That was a very shameful thing to do. 
It was almost as if he had betrayed his nation. It was almost like he had betrayed his clan. And so if anyone ever squandered their wealth in a Gentile nation, so all the Gentiles now have the wealth of the Israelite, the Jewish person, if that person were to come back to their clan, to their home, to their town, to their city, and people caught wind that they were coming back because they knew what had happened, they would go out and they would rush to the gates of the town. They wouldn't let that individual in, that young man in. They would say, you can't come in. And when they went out, they would have a jar like this. And all of the townspeople would come out. Everybody would come out. The whole community would come out. And they would take this jar and they would show it to the young man. And they would take this jar in front of him and shatter it. And they would pick up a piece of that jar and they would say, you are broken. You have broken trust with your community. You have shamed your father. You have ruined everything that your father has. You have broken his heart. You have embarrassed your community. You are, this is what this word, kazaza, means. It means you are cut off. You are as useful as a broken pot is to us. You are dead to us. You're not welcome. You're not family any longer. Get out. I think that's why the son in Jesus' parable waited for so long to go back. Because he realized, I've squandered my father's wealth in a Gentile nation. And there is no way I'm going to be welcome back. But it got so severe for him that he thought, you know what? That's pretty bad. But if I stay here, I'm going to die. I can't do this on my own. I need help. And he thought it was going to be rejected. But that young man, and some of you know what this feels like. Some of you feel like, you know what? My life is shattered into a million pieces. There's no way any of this can be made whole again. No one wants me. I'm damaged goods. What use is this? A life shattered. But this young man misjudged his father. He misjudged his father. You ever notice how you can tell who somebody is at a distance because of the way they walk? You know, oh, I know who that is. Um, way before my time, but John, way, John Wayne, a movie actor from the, you know, from the early days, black and white movies and, and so forth, when he first started out, he hated the way that he walked, and so he spent hours and hours and hours teaching himself how to walk in, you know, with a swag. And, it, I mean, this is really a thing. You can actually go out and Google the John Wayne walk. He did. He would go in front of mirrors, and he would do this, and he just had this cool you know, swag, and he was known for the way that he walked. Well, the father knew how the son walked. He saw him take his first steps. He saw him play growing up. He saw him walking around the farm, playing around the farm. He knew what his son looked like. It says in the next sentence of Jesus' story, but while he, the son, was still a long way off, his father saw him. I know that walk. I know that shape. His father saw him, and he was filled not with anger, not with hatred, but with what? Compassion for him. And he ran to his son. This is not just, you know, hey, he got off and just started jogging out there. This word ran is a technical word, and it's used of athletic events. Okay, in other words, the father ran in an all-out sprint. He raced to his son. Now, this was something that would never have happened because in that day, as the patriarch of the family, he would have been very dignified. He would have had really elaborate clothes, robes, long flowing robes, necklaces, the whole nine yards. And in that day, as in our day, really, really important people, really dignified people never run. I haven't ran in like 12 years. I mean, you know, I'm just kidding. It would be like seeing the President of the United States coming off Air Force One, going across a tarmac, and running to some other world leader. You just, it would just never happen. It would be undignified. And 
for this man to run, for a man to run in that day, he would have had to hike up his robe. And hiking up your robe would have exposed his bare legs, which would have been shameful, obscene in that day. And so this is not just like a little trot. He actually hikes the things up. He doesn't care who sees his bare legs because his son is more important to him than the shame that will come on himself for exposing himself in that way. And so he takes off for a sprint. And do you know why he's taking off in a sprint? Because he knows if I don't reach my son first, the community will. And if the community reaches him first, they'll go through this ceremony, the Kazasa ceremony. And they'll shatter that pot, and they'll tell him he's worth nothing. They'll tell him he's broken faith, that he's not welcome, that he's cut off, he's not family. And I don't want my son to have that message because I may never get him back after that. It may destroy him, and I don't want him destroyed. Why? Because I love him. The father never stopped loving his boy no matter how far his boy went from home. And the boy never stopped needing his father no matter how far the boy went from home. It doesn't matter how far you go. It doesn't matter what you have done. God's love for you never stops. It never runs out. And the whole time you're running from God, the whole time you're keeping God at a distance, the whole time you're doing that, your need for him never diminishes. The father ran to his son, and when he got to his son, he hugged him and kissed him and threw his arms around him, and it just, he kissed him over and over and over. That's the language that Jesus used. He just wanted, he showed him his affection. He said, you're welcome. You're my son. I love you. I love you. I love you. I'm so glad you came back. I'm so glad you came back. And you oftentimes wonder, what kind of God was waiting for me? It's this kind of God that's waiting for you. It's that kind of God who says, come, if you'll just turn in my direction, I will run. I, because I don't want this ceremony. I don't want you to feel cut off. I don't want you to feel like you're broken and never can be put back together. I love you. Come home. You're my son. You're my daughter. Come home. That's the kind of God that waits for you. That's the kind of God that waits for you. So, What are you waiting for? Come home. And this is the remarkable thing about God. We talk about his grace and, and his mercy, and it's more than you can imagine. But when we turn, when we repent, God not only forgives us, and we kind of expect that from God, that he might forgive us because he's gracious and he's merciful. It's not just that he forgives us. It's that he is glad to see us. Like he said, yes! And we're thinking, oh, but I've done this and I've done that. He's like, ah, it doesn't matter. Come home. I am glad to see you. I am filled with joy you came in my direction. And I'm the first one to greet you. Do you realize that's how God feels about you? Do you realize that's how God, why God wants you so much? Because he loves you that much? Let me ask you a question. Be honest with yourself. Have you been in a distant country? Are you in a distant country right now? Maybe you've, you know, made a lot of terrible decisions. You've been through a really ugly, messy divorce or two or three or four of them. You've slept with so many people you you don't even know who who they are. You've gotten involved in things that have become habits that now control your life. You lie compulsively. You steal. You cheat. You're in a far country, and you're searching, and you're searching, and you're searching, and you just realize, you know, something's got to change. I've got so many regrets. Are you in a distant country? Because here's the thing. And I want to say this as clearly as I can possibly say it. No matter who you are, or what you've done, or how far you have gone, you can come home to your Father who loves you.
And when you come home to your father, it's not being cut off. It's not a ceremony of shame. It's not a ceremony where you're excommunicated. Let me tell you something. At Journey, there is no kazaza. There is none. We realize, you know what? Nobody's perfect. Everybody's welcome. And we believe that anything is possible with this kind of God. That's what Melissa experienced. I want to see a part of her, her story where she has her own prodigal experience and what she found when she came back to her father. My journey started when I was two years old and my mom and my um, dad divorced and I, we had lived with my grandmother for a long time and my grandmother and I did not have a good relationship. I met my ex-husband when I was a junior, met at a bar. I didn't really know who I was though at 16, 17 years old to be in, in love or even know what it meant. It was just something was missing, but I just was so in the moment and wanted like to get married and the whole fairy tale that I kind of pushed those feelings aside. Um, once we had my daughter, it definitely took a turn for the worse. His behavior changed and my behavior changed. And then once I found out I was pregnant with my son, I felt like I was just stuck. I, you know, I have two kids and I definitely don't want to be a single mom with two kids. So I knew something had to change and I just kind of went to the wrong way to make that change. Um, I had an affair, and then on Father's Day weekend, I had another affair. I think from the beginning of being with a grandmother that treated me like a piece of crap to now being in a relationship that I just destroyed and slept with multiple men, I, there was no God. And if he was there, he was not a nice person. So, I mean, I would, I would pray, but I didn't know who I was praying to. I just kind of, someone's there, so hear me, and you probably hate me, and why would you let this happen? The last affair I had um, turned into a relationship. It lasted three years, and it was a living hell. I was emotionally and physically abused, and my son was physically abused. Scissors being thrown, TVs being thrown, you know, me locked in a room with a gun to my head and they were just on the other side screaming. And during, during that time, I became a drug addict. I was on coke, and I drank a lot. And it lasted three years because I didn't know how to get out of it. So the only way I was able to get out of it was um, I moved. So I moved and didn't know where I was. Before I moved, I met my now husband. The first day I met him, we, like, Literally, an hour after I met him, we ate at a TGI Fridays. We told each other stuff, and there was no judging because we both were there. <laughs> we both had similar stories. It was scary. So I sobered myself up. Still had no God, but just knew I needed to do something because I was probably going to lose my kids. So we decided to get married, and before we did, we found the church. Everyone was amazing with our kids and where they should go and we it was it was life-changing. It is life-changing for it was it was amazing. When once the first service that we went to we knew we needed to get baptized before we got married. That we needed to wash all the sins that we have committed in our previous marriages before me and him committed to each other. For years, many years, my husband and I both tried to do it on our own and that wasn't working. So now we have a place that we could turn to um, when we need it. It's a relief, it's definitely a relief in any part of our relationship. If we have a troublesome moment, we turn to God, we pray. We're not going to drugs and alcohol and affairs, we're going to God. So that is a relief to have that. In our small group, people who message me daily, what can we pray for you about? It's an awesome feeling. It's a place that I am comforted and loved unconditionally, no matter what. It's what a home should feel like, and it does. Yeah. It's a place where I 
should be loved unconditionally. That's what home feels like. That's what home feels like. I'm so thankful for her experience. And you know what? It's not unique. <laughs> what kind of God do you think is waiting on you? What did you grow up thinking? What picture of God did you get from the church that you went to or from the TV that you watched or whatever it was? Was it somebody who was going to cut you off, strike you with a lightning bolt? Because that God does not exist. That's not our God. You say, well, what kind of God is waiting for you? It's the kind of God that we see in Jesus. You don't want to know how God responds to people who are far from him, who are broken, who are way, way, way far away. He responds how Jesus responds. By being present with us, promising never to leave us on our own. He is full of grace, refusing to condemn us when it's even deserved. And there are times when we feel like, you know what, I I totally deserve it. He doesn't condemn us. He is humble towards us, bending down and caring for our needs. And he's sacrificing for us when we are helpless to save ourselves. That's the kind of God that waits for you. There is help, and his name is Jesus. He's been there all along. He's been speaking into your life in ways that you maybe not have discerned just yet, but now it's kind of, there's an awakening happening on the inside. You see, the bottom line is simply this. We receive God's help when we admit our need and turn in his direction. We receive God's help. The God of the universe wants to help. He wants to embrace He wants to love you. He wants to accept you. He wants wants you to come home. And all that you need to do is admit your need. I I can't do this, God. I need help. And turn in his direction. And he sprints to you. Embracing you. Kissing you over and over again. Saying, I love you. I love you. I'm so glad you're home. Oh, let's have a party. Let's celebrate. My son, my daughter, has come home. Maybe you walked in here today feeling like you were broken. I'm just going to tell you something. Brokenness is not going to have the final word in your life. Jesus is. Brokenness is not getting the last word in your life. Jesus does. He's the healer. He's the savior. And he's the one that can make you new and whole and take the pieces that you thought could never be made whole and make them into something beautiful. All you have to do is surrender. That's all you have to do. Would you bow in prayer with me? Father, thank you for being a God who loves who runs towards those who are broken, who has compassion beyond comprehension. Father, we admit we've all been in a distant country. We've all experienced a breaking in our lives. We've all experienced a shattering of our heart, our soul. And right now, Father, we admit our need for you. God, thank you for your love and your mercy your kindness, and your goodness. We pray through Jesus.